night. Uh, if folks want to trickle in, I think we have a few. Do we have any open seats? Does anybody see any open seats? Is anybody sitting there? Somebody? Okay. That seat maybe is open. Uh, what about the one next to you? No? Someone is sitting there? Okay. Um, so sorry, uh, yeah, we're working on getting a bigger room, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but welcome to the OpenGov Hack Night. It's Chicago's place to build, learn, and share about civic tech and OpenGov. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a really awesome presentation about an open source ebook called Data and Design. Uh, that'll be really exciting. Uh, it's, it fits in a lot of different ways with this community. It's open source, which we like, and it's also working with data and designing around data, which is like very much in the spirit of this, uh, this group. Uh, but before we do that, we'll, uh, we have a few uh, items on the agenda that we like to run through. Um, the first one is everyone has to uh, introduce themselves. I promise it won't take long, and it's probably one of the best parts of the night because everybody gets to see all the different crazy things that everybody else does, which it's always exciting to hear about. Uh, and then uh, we'll have an open floor for announcements. If anybody wants to share anything that's OpenGov or civic tech related with the group, uh, we also started, you know, people have been uh, uh, promoting uh, job openings or they're seeking jobs, that's another thing. People have been hired out of this group, uh, so it is possible. Um, and then we'll get to the presentation, and then after we'll break out and use the rest of the 1871 space to hack on stuff. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, structure for that too, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, I like to do this in the very beginning. As a show of hands, uh, how many of you is this your first hack night that you've been to? All right, and welcome to the new people. All right, um, so this gentleman here, Christopher, uh, has, uh, has a plan for you guys. Um, also, by the way, we're recording everything you say, so <laughs> so be aware of what you say. No, it's uh, yeah, we, we actually put these up, uh, uh, these these streams. It's being live streamed right now, and it's also um, archived on YouTube uh, on, Smart on the Smart channel. Chicago uh, channel, uh, which we link to, I think, from this uh, from the Hacknet website. Um, so uh, yeah, again, welcome to all the new people. Um, always glad to see new faces. Uh, and I think we'll, without any other things to talk about, we'll get into the introductions. Um, so I'm Derek Eater. I'm one of the organizers of this event. I'm a partner at DataMade, a local civic tech company here in Chicago. Uh, and I like to build stuff with open data. Um, here, let's go over this way. Hi, guys. I'm, I'm Hong Yu. I'm a web developer for blockchain. And this is my first time here. And I'm glad to, to, class to, know, to learn more about this event and uh, everything about uh, the data that we're going to use and open source Great. and stuff. Cool. Uh, my name is Maliki. I'm a software developer. Hi, I'm Jeff Hank. Uh, I'm a developer who works with Open Arch in the DC3. I'm Blythe. I work for a tech startup that does advertising with social data. I'm Eric. I am a GIS analyst uh, working with the Illinois Department. <laughs> uh, Charles Fisher, Silver Spring Networks. We do smart grid deployments for utilities and cities. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm a freelance software developer, and I'm interested in uh, urban sustainability. I'm also Scott. Uh, I'm a, uh, an economist, and I do uh, consulting for financial risk management. <clears throat> you gonna say hi, Christopher? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Christopher Whitaker. I am a uh, civic technology consultant here in Chicago, Illinois. I'm also the Code for America Brigade Captain, and I'll be teaching Civic Hacking 101 uh, later this evening. Cool. I'm Jim. I'm an independent uh, software developer and musician, and I play a lot of jazz over there. Uh, my name is Stephen Vance, and I'm a transportation reporter for a website called Street Squad Chicago. Steve Ediger, and I am Which is the largest installation of solar panels outside downtown Chicago. By the way, this room, this is row, is what, four Steves in this room? Okay. That's a Steve record. It was two Scott. Oh, sorry, Scott and Steve. I'm sorry. Scratch that. I'm Ben Gallucci. I'm a government. 
Java architect with the SPA group, uh, the co-facilitator of the Illinois Pension Reform breakout group here. And the only thing I like more than data is design. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're part of a nonprofit uh, group, but we also run an IT next to the state groups that we think go into the web. And pretty much does the financial services on it. Cool. My name is Ahad Cameron, and I do so many investments. I'm also an SBA in Europe, and I'm going to be sick of IV. Chase Larson, Progressive Voting Labs. I live in the Polar, so I'm going to have to say. Okay, great. Bro. Jeff Rothman. <coughs> I work for a local software company. I'm interested in data exploration, kind of like a GIS cube and just I've always had worked with proprietary software because I didn't work in the Department for Bill years. So I'm now building a plane of open source and actually making my own app out of you know other data that was there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brandon Fox. I'm a fan of Sam Fisher's map.
Again, here are ways I work on urban sustainability issues. I don't think I don't do anything to the environment. I'm April Johnson, and this is my first time here, and I'm a professor of political science at USC. I'm an Alex from Chesapeake. I'm a qualitative researcher, and I'm using a website that helps people decide who to vote for in the local election. I'm Marina. I'm a product designer, and I'm also working on an app that came from one of these wonderful hack nights called Emerly with Genevieve and Rose. My name is George. I work for the Chicago Public Library um, Maker Lab, where we give the public access to digital fabrication tools. Awesome. By the way, I think, is that everybody, by the way? Is there anybody? Did you guys anybody? Okay, great, awesome. Well, as you can tell, like, very diverse group, lots of backgrounds, but we all love open data and civic tech, right? So, excellent. Um, there's a lot of people in the hallway. Um, I'm think, I'm wondering, Renee, you, would you be up for doing the overflow room again this time? Sure, that's fine. So, if we can find the room, we have yeah, there, I mean, they're usually empty. There's a couple extra rooms around the hall over here. Um, just I'm worried, like, that hallway is really crowded and uh, you won't, probably won't be able to hear the presentation. So, if you want to watch the presentation, literally, we're going to live stream it from this room to that room. <laughs> we have the technology. We can do it. Uh, so, okay, great. I'm glad to. And there's one extra chair up here that is the chair that I sit in. So, you can just come up and take it. Okay, and great. And I'll end up at lunch. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, great. Introductions are done. Moving on to announcements. Does anybody have anything they'd like to share uh, with the group? Uh, newsworthy things or uh, projects, yeah. Um, so as I said, I'm working on a congestion analysis study with the Rowan Department of Transportation, and we are looking for an intern. So if you're interested in uh, big data and transportation and all that sort of stuff, uh, hit me up. Awesome. Other announcements? Uh, I have a quick one. Um, we launched a thing last week. Yay! 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 Thing. Okay, this thing is called Lenario. Uh, the next stage in open data. Uh, I'll let you decide if that's true or not. Uh, but essentially what it is, is uh, an API and then um, an interface for exploring data uh, throughout space and time. So the idea is 
uh, it's a place where you can upload data to, uh, and it's ingestible, so there's open data from all over the country, in fact. And it knows about the where and the when of any data that you give it. So what you can do is something cool like this and say, hey, I care about data in this little part of Chicago in the last 90 days or so. Show me all the data here. Then it's loading you the system. So you can zoom in, and then you can see, oh, look, there's some data about crime. There's some data about business licenses. And there's some data about building permits. So you can say, hey, look, oh, interesting, some building permits for this little area. Um, so this is a prototype. It's an alpha. Um, it's all open source. Uh, it's a, a partnership between, uh, it's an NSF-funded project uh, through the um, uh, University of Chicago Urban Center for Computation and Data, and Database, uh, my company, is uh, the implementer on the technical side. So uh, feel free to poke around um, on it. A really cool page to go to is Planario <laughs> slash examples. Oops, examples. Uh, and these are some kind of neat example queries that we put together to sort of show you what it can do. So I want to know everything that's going on in 700 Howard Street in San Francisco. And you can play around with the actual seeing the data that's there, or you can play around with the query itself uh, in the builder. So these are some examples of what you can do with it. Um, again, the code's all open source, um, and the thing is sort of out there for people to play around with and think about the uses for this kind of way of exploring data. So uh, everybody is invited to go check this place out. Yeah. Um, any other announcements before we get to the main event? OK, great. Well, then without further ado, here's Trina and Data Design. Hey, thanks, everyone, for coming. And it's awesome to see so many different backgrounds here. Uh, a lot of people are working on data. <coughs> design and programming, which are three things that I really enjoy. So uh, that's really awesome to get to see. So I did something new this year that I've never done before. And that was write an open source book about data with uh, more than 50 people around the globe. Uh, so this was a new experience for me, and it was a whole lot of fun. And I'm going to start by just saying a little bit about myself. This is who I am. I'm a web nerd. And that means a lot of things. It means that I like to make things. It means that I'm in that sweet spot between design, code, and data. And that's where I've been for a couple of years. And what I do is I geek out on paper graphics. So a couple of years ago, I started a tech startup called Interactive. And we build a web app for making interactive infographics and data visualizations. Yes? Question. Can you send the slides after? Or just send them now? I can, I can send the slides. Or can we post the slides after? Sure. Yes. Yes. You'll have slides. Uh, <clears throat> last year, I also did a fellowship with the Reynolds Journalism Institute. Their mission is to help journalists. And we thought that we could work together to make it easier for journalists to tell stories with data or provide resources for journalists. Together with RJI, um, RJI was really interested in this data design book that we've been working on since January. And so they're a sponsor of that project as well. And then more recently, in the past couple of months, um, I got together with a lot of really great folks in Montreal, and we started a visualization, data visualization meetup group, and that's been pretty successful. We've held our first couple of meetups so far. So that's my background. Basically, it's a way of saying that my entire life revolves around data visualization, and it's a lot of fun. So the way that I got into writing this book was we were starting a Kickstarter for my web app, Infoactive. And I received messages from people all over the place, but I received one message from uh, a woman in Chicago named Diana. And Diana writes, hi, Trina. Zach Sorek from Chicago here. Do you have any plans to include tutorials for basic data cleaning and data selection techniques for users who may not have any statistics background? And I said, Diana, that's a fantastic idea, because while we focus on the visualization side of things, there's not much that we do to help users understand whether or not the data they're putting into the system is any good to begin with. Is there selection bias? Is the data complete? Is it formatted in a way that we can programmatically understand? Um, and it's, it's a pretty, pretty big problem to solve. And I said, this is a fantastic idea. Um, we're two people. How much can we do? What should we do? And so we started having a conversation. <coughs> And because I love embarking on ginormous projects with random strangers, uh, we decided to write a book. <laughs> and we also figured, realized that this was a project that was valuable outside of the scope of Infoactive. And so we decided to make it a book that was free, open source, creative commons licensed, and platform agnostic so that it's valuable.
valuable regardless of what tool set you're using to visualize information. So we started this because we, we had this epiphany. And this epiphany was that so Diana came from a, a statistics background. She's taught a lot of statistics courses, and she was also a librarian. So she's done all of the research to try to find good resources for intro level people getting into data and visualization. And what she found is that a lot of the textbooks or resources that cover more advanced data topics are usually written by people with <coughs> PhDs and edited by people with uh, PhDs in statistics and not really edited for general audiences. And so there are some data resources out there that are more of a beginner level, but they don't cover the complex topics. So what we wanted to do, our real mission with this, was to make a guide that didn't dumb it down, but uh, took the extra work to explain the hard stuff in a way that's friendly, conversational, approachable, and something that a designer could go to, a designer who says, I'm not a math person, can go and read this content and feel like this is, okay, this is something that I can really relate to. It's about math and data, but I feel really welcome reading this content. So that was our mission from the get <coughs> And we also had these conditions. We wanted it to be free. We wanted lots of different perspectives of students to come into this. We wanted it to be creative commons license, and we wanted it to be open source. And so all of these things presented unique challenges. I hadn't ever coordinated an open source project of this size before, so it was a really interesting learning experience for me. And the, the funny thing is that as far as I can tell, there's no open source book on how to write an open source book, <laughs> which I, I know is crazy. Um, so we we had to think a lot about how we were going to coordinate this project to make it work. So we started out with an application. We we put together a Google form and we tweeted it out. We sent it out on Facebook. We sent it <coughs> to our email networks and. People started sharing it around the globe, and we were amazed when we started seeing these applications pour in from all over the world. We had over 100 people fill out our application to be part of this project. And we were looking specifically for two different groups of people, technical people who had training and knowledge in math and statistics and data, and people that had absolutely no training in this subject. We really wanted those folks to read over the entire book and say, this makes sense to me, or this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not a math person. I don't understand this. Please rewrite it in a way that this feels good to me as a reader. Uh, so that was really important to us, to have a range of different voices contributing to the project. So we received all of these um, applications, and we kicked off the project with a write-a-thon in Chicago. So we brought a few speakers together, and we held the event down at Blue 1647, which is a community space down in Tilton. And we got together, and we sat down, and we started writing, and tried to figure out what it, how it was that we were going to work on the rest of this project. And then Diana and I sat down the next day for an entire day, read through every single application, and all the comments were, were amazing. Um, and we started looking at the list of chapters and sections that we wanted in the book, and started trying to figure out who would be best for what different sections. Um, and then we started emailing people and asking, hey, are you still into this? Would you be willing to write this chapter? Would you be willing to serve as an editor in this capacity? And because we had so many people, we also uh, created project managers to manage each section, which made the whole process much smoother and easier for us to manage, because it is, it is difficult to keep a group of 60 volunteers <coughs> all on the same page and as a cohesive unit. Um, we also set very clear expectations from the beginning. We had a Google site that we used to organize the whole process. We used Google Docs because they're free and most people are familiar with how to use them. Um, we also created writing style guides to set forth some expectations. Here's the direction of the book. Here's what we're trying to accomplish with it. Uh, we want the language to be friendly and approachable, and this is how we, we plan to do that so that we, even though we wanted the unique voices of all of the writers to shine through, we also wanted it to have a cohesive voice at the same time. Um, so that really helped to make sure that the project ran smoothly. This is my favorite page in the book. It's the contributors page. We ended up with a lot of amazing people. Um, we had 
NASA engineers, we had neuroscience PhDs, we had documentary filmmakers and artists and journalists and professors. We had an amateur cat yodeler on the team. <laughs> and if any of you ever have the chance to work with an amateur cat yodeler, based on my experience, it's a really positive experience. <laughs> it's absolutely phenomenal to work with. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. This is all of our contributors as one. Um, I really like seeing all of them together. And of course, there's always this guy who's on any project. <laughs> <laughs> they, they blew my mind. They were absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, so something I learned in the course of doing this project is to never underestimate the awesomeness of strangers on the internet and the, the no peers, especially those strangers who volunteer to write books about data in their free time. Those are good people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we also, I, I was amazed throughout the project at little things that the contributors did um, that really made my day. For example, I had a lot of kind of grunt work tasks that I felt really guilty about when I worked with the contributors because they all had such amazing experiences and I didn't want anyone to have to work on these grunt work tasks. But there was one contributor in particular who was extremely intelligent and had a lot of extra free time during the week. And so I said, uh, maybe I'll give it a shot. So I gave her the task of taking, we had a lot of data tables in different formats. We had them in Google Docs, um, Word Docs, Microsoft Excel, and Google Sheets. And we had to turn all of these tables into HTML tables for the books. And so I found this little form I needed to cut and paste, and it kind of made the process easier, but it was still, you know, that process times 50 tables in these different formats. And so I handed it to her, and I kind of cringed and felt bad. And then two days later, she said, you know, I looked at this project and I thought that this might be a good time for me to learn Python. Why not? <laughs> so she so she figured out how to create a script to generate these tables for us. And I was so super impressed and extremely pleased by this. And she wasn't bored and didn't feel bad about doing this grunt work because it gave her the opportunity to start learning Python, which is awesome. Um, another example would be I had more kind of little tasks and one of our contributors from Australia uh, reached, would reach out every now and again and say, hey, do you have something for me? Do you have anything for me to work on? And I'd give him things. And then at one point he emailed me and said, oh, and by the way, please feel free to send me all of the, the really tedious little grunt work tasks that you have because I'm over in Australia and I can work kind of as a second shift during the night. And I said, okay, and I sent him some. And sure enough, first thing to the next morning, he had finished it, super happy about it. Uh, it was really awesome to see. And then this was a chapter that was particularly hard. We had an email chain going for about a month. There was a whole process of putting it together from um, audio, basically audio uh, files that had to be then transcribed, that then had to be edited to sound like they were written rather than spoken, and then examples that had to be re redone. And we had this huge email thread that lasted over a month. And one day I open up my email and I see the chapter wearing a birthday hat. <laughs> and one of the contributors decided that since the thread was a month old, she would celebrate by taking some of her free time and going into Photoshop and turning the chapter into a chapter with a birthday hat. So I thought that was really amazing and I was really happy to work with people that did things like this. Uh, after we had finished writing and editing, doing most of the editing for the book and the each of the chapters went through several rounds of revision um, with different types of editors going through it. We used a tool called O'Reilly Atlas to take, that, um, take those Google Docs and turn them into a book. And so uh, O'Reilly has created a tool that um, basically allows you to generate a PDF, HTML, EPUB, and Mobi <coughs> all with the same HTML files. And it, syncs up really nicely with Git. So basically it's a, it's a wussy wig in the browser that our contributors who were not familiar with writing HTML could use to edit the content. And then it would sync up with our uh, GitHub repo and allow whoever wanted to work in HTML and Git their ability to do that. And people that really had no idea what that meant and just wanted to edit the text, they could do that too. And it, worked really nicely together. And then at the end, it's it's literally a Ruby gem, so we just build the book and you're done. And the book, this is, this is how it ended up. Um, 
This is, this is the book homepage, and you can read it online as HTML or you can download as PDF. We do not require you to enter an email, um, so it's just a click through. And then there's a little bit of content about how and why we started. Um, and also this get involved section. There's a form here that people have been using to report a misplaced comma in the second image on chapter 17. <laughs> um, I thought we had so many people read through and edit it, but it's amazing what you'll find when you unleash it to the world and ask them to contribute, which is one of the strengths of the book as well. Um, we could have been very perfectionist about it, but at a certain point we just wanted to release version one. And I think it actually makes people happy to be able to contribute in that way and say, oh, I found the misplaced comma in the second image in chapter 17, and I can report that and I can then contribute to this project. Um, so I think that's been really neat. And people have also been using this form to uh, contact us about writing new chapters or contributing to editing processes in the future or contributing to uh, other language versions of the book. And, uh, oops. And the rest, yeah, so um, then we also put the project on GitHub, so it's open sourced and anyone can contribute to it. And the wonderful thing about unleashing it is that people do contribute to it. On the first day it was up, we already had a pull request of someone adding uh, arrow key support between the chapters, which I thought was awesome. There's 600 things that we could have taken the extra time to build, but it was much nicer to see those things kind of coming into the main project after. Um, and we also have the, uh, the book is also being translated into <coughs> different languages now. We already have a group that's formed in Montreal and they're working on translating <coughs> it into French and also adding culturally relevant examples, taking some of the examples throughout the book that have to do with geographic location or certain um, topics that are related to North American or European audiences and turning those into a more specific culturally relevant examples that are closer to the culture of Quebec or France. And we also have a Spanish language version that's being built right now. Um, there are other chapters in the works. We weren't able to get all of the chapters into the first iteration of the book because there were some that just simply weren't done and we thought it was more important to give this to the world early rather than wait until everything's perfect and all of the chapters are in place. So we have some upcoming chapters as well. Uh, some of the chapters that you can see, this will load. Uh, this one's a very popular one called Perception Deception. Mm -hmm. So talking about how we perceive differences in color and contrast and how that affects the way that we perceive the underlying data. Mm -hmm. um, talking about color scales, it talks about why not to do 3D charts, I believe. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a beauty example right there. <laughs> um, and there's also, yeah, there's, there's all of these different sections. So we have five sections. We, at first we talk about the data fundamentals, so talking about different data types and what it means to have aggregated data versus raw data. Uh, we talk about the data collection process, data preparation and cleaning, visualizing the information, and then a couple of chapters on things to watch out for, things to avoid. And that's, that's about all I have for the book itself. I wanna open it up to questions. How much time do I have? Oh, we have like, okay. like 10, 10 minutes or so. Okay, yes. Um, first of all, I just wanna say that this was really, really impressive, and I think it's amazing that it was successful. So I guess my question is like, because I work a lot in local politics and in organizing, for example, so I work with all volunteers a lot, and it is so hard to get effective coordination on anything, let alone writing a freaking book. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. any, you know, anything, any experiences you learned from that, uh, would love to hear. Yeah, so I mean, that is a big issue, and I thought it was going to be a very big problem starting out on the project, too, because I also have experience working on volunteer-run projects, and they have, in my experience, they've always been very difficult. Um, I think something that we did really well was we held very clear boundaries, and we set very clear expectations from the beginning when we expected to have the first chapters in, 
and what we expected those chapters to look like, having the style guides go out to the writers in advance and having specific job descriptions for each of the editors that were contributing helped a lot for us, but I think it also helped the people contributing as well because they felt like they had a very clear direction. No one wants to join a project and feel really wishy-washy about what their role is. Um, so it really helped in that sense. The other thing that I found, we, we had a, over 100 people apply to begin with, but you'll notice we only have 55 or so contributors on the end page, and I think that's pretty typical and pretty normal. I was expecting a pretty high dropout rate. Um, in the very beginning, when we started sending emails out to contributors, if they didn't, res if it took them a week to respond, they were out of the project because it was going to drain a lot of our resources to try to chase people down again and again. And we tried to get no's from people as quickly as possible, um, checking in and making sure that they had time. And if they didn't have time, it was okay to cut their chapter, <coughs> assign it to someone else. Uh, for example, there were a few people that, or a couple people that had babies during the project, so one person. <laughs> had twins and dropped out for a while, understandably, but it was good for us to have communication with him and him saying, okay, I'm not gonna be able to help you out during this time, um, and that was, that was extremely helpful. And like I said, there were a few chapters that we had to cut at the end because they weren't ready yet, and um, I think that's just part of the process. But one thing that I found with this project is that there were five people, I think, that just went above and beyond every expectation I could have had, and those people really pulled it together. We had one guy who stepped in and just owned the repo, <laughs> and that was really wonderful to have, and he's still there um, coordinating, you know, taking the pull requests and fixing the errors that are being reported, um, that kind of thing. And I think the, the key part, part for me was to find those specific people that were pulling the majority of the weight, and we've added little stars to their bios on the contributor page because <laughs> they're awesome. Um, so just very quickly identifying who's going to be the rock star and who might be unreliable over time was, was something that really helped us. Yes? I think it's the question. Oh, who? Scott. Scott. Yeah. Hey. Oh, yeah, quite uh, so I was just curious how much like traction you've got, like how many downloads, and, and how you advertise something like this without any source of income or whatever. You know, I mean, I'm looking for a book. I usually like go to Amazon.com mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you reach people, and, and how have you guys done so far reaching people? Mm -hmm. um, to be honest, I don't know exactly how many people have. Uh, read it or visited it at this point. The last time I checked, it was around 17k uniques, and we released it at the end of August. So it's gotten some good traction. People are still tweeting about it pretty much every day. I mean, it definitely was a spike right when we first launched it, and everyone was excited, and they were sharing it with their teams and sharing it on Twitter. A lot of the traffic has come through social networks and just organic growth, which has been really nice to see. Um, we did, we did try to do a little bit of press outreach at the end, but PR is not really my forte. Um, so I, I might have dropped the ball on that a little bit. We got a few articles out there, but the majority of it just came through organic traffic. Yes? So um, your project obviously is really interesting and it's a big accomplishment, but at the end you produce a book. So who, who would you say is your intended audience? Uh, Good question. When we started, it was uh, more geared toward graphic designers, right? We were noticing that a lot of graphic designers claimed to be math phobic or data phobic or would say, oh, I am, I'm a designer, I can't do math. And for one, I think that's bogus. I think that designers can do math and I think that math people can do art and I'd love to change that perspective. Um, and so that was kind of the mindset going into it. but. You know, it, it did become more of a broad audience as we went. About half the book is really geared toward working with data, and the other half is really geared toward working with design. And I come from a little bit more of a design background than a data background, um, but my co-organizer, Diana, definitely comes from a data background. And in the final sections of the book, she said, yeah, everyone that I work with needs to know this information. This isn't just for designers, this is also for data people. They need to know about the design principles, fonts and colors and iconography, and how, how to visualize information and things to think about in the design. So I, I'd say that the core intended, intended audience are people who want to work with data more and might not feel quite comfortable knowing where to begin and need a friendly introduction. But I'd say that 
different chapters are applicable to a range of different audiences. Okay, so how to work with data and then how to present the data, not mm -hmm. only to understand it, but how will be the best way to present it. Exactly. Yes. Do you have a 3D visualization? Uh, we have a section of the book dedicated to explaining why not to do 3D pie charts and 3D bar charts. I'd like to volunteer to add another chapter <laughs> to challenge that notion. <coughs> please, please get in touch on our... On our translate to Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> all of the above, please, yeah, get in touch. We welcome all critiques and feedback, yes. Uh, so would you, uh, after doing this, do it again? And if so, how would you do it differently? Hmm. If at all. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I, I have a... I do have an answer to that. Um, yes, I would do it again. It was so valuable. I'm excited that the project's continuing. I've taken a little bit of a break since publishing it, but there are some chapters that are in the pipeline that I'd really like to finish, and I'd love to see the French and Spanish version. And there are other people thinking about Mandarin. I don't know if that's the Chinese that you're yeah, thinking Mandarin about. Mandarin just has dialects. If we had the same written format as the Cantonese and any other yeah. dialects. Yeah. Yeah, so Mandarin might happen, German might happen too. Those are a traditional font, which is in Taiwan and Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, I cannot do it, but I really can, so that's not a big deal. But the thing that I would definitely do differently if I had to do it again is that I, a lot of the editors were too nice, right? When you're working <laughs> on a project with a bunch of strangers, you want to be nice. And the people that ended up really helping us at the end in an editing capacity were actually a group of people that we had assigned as marketing or distribution contributors, right? Because we had more contributors than we had roles for in the book. And so we decided to have a group of marketing or distribution people. And then toward the end of the project, we started having a series of conference calls with these people to talk about their specific projects. And something we hadn't done with the other editors was have conference calls to bring everyone together and have them get to know each other. And what happened when we started having these conference calls is they became really comfortable with each other and started feeling like they had more ownership in the project. And so when they started digging into the book and we realized that they might be useful as editors as well, they actually became some of our most valuable contributors. And it wasn't because the other contributors weren't good, it was because we had built this relationship with this particular group of people that made them feel more comfortable really digging in. So I'd say that um, a lot of the chapters weren't edited as heavily as we would have liked in the first part of the project. So from the beginning, if I had to do it again, I would put in that extra effort to get small groups of people on conference calls really working closely together and give them permission to give those harsh critiques and be really upfront about their thoughts from the very beginning. Yes? Yeah, is this book, um, is it done, or is there just like a busy one? It's never going to be complete. There will always be another chapter. Mm -hmm. How is that set up? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Version one is complete, and there will be iterations moving forward. You know, there have been little typos um, changed since we released version one, and there are other parts of it in the works. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, what do you think are the weaknesses of an open source book compared to a regular book? For example, uh, can you do you have uh, running examples? You know, the same example used in different chapters to illustrate different aspects of it. We try to have that consistency as much as possible. So there's a theme, a recurring theme throughout the book of using food. And we use that example specifically because we wanted to avoid controversial examples. It's really easy to pull up data sets that have to do with politics and controversial topics um, or, say, disease or death rates. And we wanted people to focus on the content of learning about data rather than a really controversial topic, whether or not they agree with it, how sad it is, how depressing it is, how angry it makes them feel. Uh, we wanted to avoid those kinds of emotional examples. So we did make sure that the different examples throughout the book followed that format. To the extent that we could, we used food, we used coffee. Um, there are other examples that are not food and coffee, but for the most part, we changed them when they were really depressing, say things like deaths from cigarettes. And we changed one example that was kind of fun about tequila, but we wanted it to be for a more PG audience, and we wanted teachers to feel comfortable using it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, were there any? Uh, do you think that the a 
approach has weaknesses in the quality of the book that you come up with? Oh, right, the open source versus um, a, a non-open source book. Yeah, I'd say it was a tremendous amount of work to, to organize an open source book because every contrib most contributors were mm -hmm. only working on it for a few hours, right? The, the super contributors who ended up putting in a tremendous number of hours were extremely valuable. Um, there is a certain amount of time investment to work with additional people. When you have one person who's perfect for the job and they understand it well and they can put in 40 hours a week and they understand the context of everything else that's going on in the book, there's definitely an advantage to that. And stringing together all of the different chapters, making sure that we're not repeating things throughout the chapters, that was something that we had an additional uh, amount of work that we had to do as well because a lot of authors wanted to talk about how terrible it is to use pie charts, but there was only one section in the book that was talking about the controversy of pie charts, right? And we didn't want the same idea repeated multiple times when it didn't quite fit into that chapter. Um, so there was extra work in that process, but I mean the, the advantage I think of the open source book as opposed to a non-open source book is that now we have thousands of people editing and reviewing it and giving, not thousands of people have filled in the little form on the homepage thankfully, but we have lots of people looking at it and thinking about contributing and adding to it over time and that's more than I could do. For sure. How about it from the reader's point of view? Does the reader will will the reader be able to make out the difference between a regular book and an open source book? I I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe one more. Yes. Uh, one more question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many, if anyone, um, people or organizations have approached you about how you went? To Hmm, good question. Well, it was only released um, at the end of <coughs> August, so it hasn't been out for a very, very long time. Um, I think I've only had one inquiry from another woman in Chicago who's putting together a book about data, and I'm not sure if her book is going to be open source or not. Um, so not, not a lot, but I've been thinking about writing a, a post about the process of putting together an open source book and maybe writing that open source book about <laughs> 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 uh, that's, that's Yeah, all. I think so, yeah, that's okay. it. But thank you. Okay. This is great. Thank you. So can you stick around for Yeah, I'll hang out for a little while after. Okay. Yeah, to come and talk and ask people have follow-up questions. So, um, great. So now we're on to the uh, hacking portion of the evening. Uh, but before we do, we have a little bit of a structure to it, which we think think helps uh, people sort of figure out uh, what they can plug into in different kind of groups. So we've uh, gone about doing that by creating uh, different groups um, that are broken up by uh, subject. Um, so you, we'll start with the first one, which is for you new folks. Uh, the Civic Hacking 101. So Christopher, for, for those of you who raised your hand in the beginning, or uh, if you, anybody else who's uh, interested in this, Christopher has uh, this for you. So if this is your first time at OpenGov Hack Night, if you are hearing the words open data, open source, GitHub for the very first time, uh, this orientation is for you. It's about 15 minutes and designed for you to take the class, learn the jargon, learn the lingo, and then bounce off to the other uh, breakout groups. So that's usually in here. It usually will take place maybe about five minutes after we break. I'll turn the fan on, get, the, get some air going in here, and we'll be good to go. Awesome. Uh, so the next group is Code 101, and Renee is actually our also doubling right now as our paging Renee, if you have to come from the overflow room. Yes. Uh, so this is a group for people who are interested in learning to program or learning to, uh, interested in learning more about open source development and sort of the, the tools and the, and the processes uh, we use sort of in this community. Uh, so it's, it's really about people who are interested in learning this sort of amongst their peers, people who are also wanting to learn this stuff. So uh, Renee is the facilitator for that. Um, if he comes back in here, I'll make sure to point him out. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, that's a group for you. Uh, transportation, Stephen. Um, we're going to talk about two things. One is Eric is going to tell us about transportation resources that he is using for his work at the Illinois Department of Transportation to pedestrian uh, analysis? Congestion analysis. Congestion analysis. 
Um, Across then, all modes of transportation. Okay. Pedestrians <laughs> included. <laughs> well, I just remembered that, but that just stuck out in my mind. And then the second thing is I'm gonna, I want to invite the two shared youth mobility center uh, staff. They're still here to tell us about that, whatever they're working on. Cool. Awesome. Oh, that's Renee. Hey, Renee, you got anything for the Code 101 group? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the topic facilitator for that. I could, uh, you know, name drop open source technology. <laughs> <laughs> but you can come to me if you have a computer and, you know, and, uh, and you have questions uh, related to coding. Um, yeah, the spill room has been a great success. Oh, excellent. excellent. Good to hear. Great to hear. Um, great. So education. Is there someone from our education group here? Elna reports that she is here. She's already in the breakout area. Okay. So that is happening. <laughs> okay. So if you're interested in education, there's a group that's been meeting every uh, every week to talk about that. Um, uh, they will be out in that room. I'll, if anybody uh, is, gets lost, just ask me and, or, a couple, or Christopher. We all know who Elna is, so you can go to her. Uh, environment. Scott, what you got there? Hi. Uh, Scott, uh, if you're interested in, if you have a project you're interested in or an issue you're interested with the environment, come find me. Um, we've been jamming for the last few weeks on our rainfall data, and so now we have an API, so we're starting to talk about potentially some visualizations. Um, also, maybe comparing it to our, is there sewage in the Chicago River? Uh, comparing uh, combined sewer overflows and, and rainfall. And then, hey Claire, you want to talk about it? Recycling group, and there's also. Okay, so we're doing recycling. Um, so as you may know, there is not recycling is not really happening for like uh, five year or more buildings. Maybe in some buildings it is, but because your landlord's being nice, um, there's actually a law that says that your landlord has to provide recycling services, but that law is just not enforced. So we are trying to work on an application that makes it easier for people to report that they're recycling. Right now, they're just reporting it. Uh, moving on, social service delivery. Rose. Hey. Um, I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I'm really excited to uh, meet with folks today. Um, M Relief is the app that we've been working on. It basically helps people see if they qualify for social services in the city of Chicago and in Illinois. And um, today we're going to be taking a peek at the awesome uh, Spanish language version of it that Renee recently created. So, we might be next to the decoders. <laughs> Uh, just kind of looking at that, and if you speak Polish, or if you write in Polish, please uh, grab me or chat with me, because we'd like to have the same thing happen for folks who speak Polish in Chicago. Awesome. That's good to hear. Uh, great. Uh, and then finally, modeling pension reform. Hey. Hi. Hi. So, uh, not everyone maybe not everyone knows that the Illinois pension system, so the three different pension systems, are facing a, an amazing financial crisis. And there are a number of proposals out there for trying to fix it, which will shift pain from one place to the other or not necessarily fix it. So what we've been trying to do uh, is examine the different pension plans, the different proposals, and create an application that allows pensioners to understand what these proposals will do to them and taxpayers to understand what it might do for them. And so we have uh, two different, those two different views. We have some JavaScript modules that now exist we're trying to play with. And tonight we're going to be talking about test-driven development of JavaScript using Jasmine to start with this. Awesome. So we'll be out that way somewhere. Excellent. Great. So as you can tell, we have uh, quite a few different uh, options. But if anybody wants to propose another group uh, around an application or a topic that we don't cover here, uh, anybody? <laughs> I have one. I really do. Oh, please. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We have a little paper reading group right now. Uh, we're going to be discussing a machine learning topic, or a decision trees today. So if you guys want to find me, that's what we're going to be doing. Is, is there like anything on the Google group for that? No. Okay. I'll find out about the paper. Yes, sir. Talk to me. Oh. 
Okay. <laughs> How about if uh, you want to do it next week, um, promote it on the uh, Google group that we have. Yeah. So also, and this is something I don't uh, tell people enough about, but we have a Google group for this night. Uh, it is linked to on the Open Golf Hack Night website uh, under the discussion section. Um, so you can um, interact with it. Oh, you have to join it uh, to like get to join it to com converse on it, um, or you can just go to it and basically it's a Google group. So it's for people to coordinate their projects or to propose uh, new projects or just to have any kind of online discussion about uh, anything pertaining to this group. So uh, please use this uh, in between Tuesdays. Uh, any uh, anybody else? Okay, well, great. Uh, thanks again to Trina for. Oh, I'm sorry. There is one. Oh, yes. Sorry. What are the names of this gentleman, the machine learning group, and also the measuring model? Yes, that's. Yes. I'm Ron Lerabendulski. My name is Dan. Yes. I'm James. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, and yeah, thanks again to Trina. Uh, and oh wait, who sponsored the food? Oh wait, Dana made sponsored the food. So you're welcome to the pizza. Uh, and we'll see everybody again next week. Thanks.